Okay, I think we should get going. Let's switch to English uh, and let's get started with Docker and Kubernetes. This will be the topic of today's lesson, as I told you. Um, we will split that into multiple parts. The first part will be a survival kit about Docker. You told me that you have some basic knowledge about Docker. You know what Docker is in general. But most of you have only very limited uh, experiences with, um, with Docker files. And that's, that's exactly what we are going to practice. OK. Do you have an idea what a Docker file already is? Correct. And that's exactly what I wanted to hear. A Docker file is a kind of recipe how to build an image. I assume that you have at least basic knowledge, a basic understanding what... Sorry, I have to close my Discord. I assume you have a basic understanding of what a Docker image is and exactly what you told us. Um, a Docker file is a recipe for building a Docker image. Are you aware of the fact that Docker images consist of layers? Do you know what that is? Some of you say yes, some of you don't. Okay, good. So this is exactly what we are going to take a look at. We are going to take a look at Docker files and you will get this slide deck from me, obviously. And let's quickly recap what uh, these Docker files and images are all about. The first thing is a recap about images and then we are going to talk about uh, Docker files. Now this is how images typically look like. You always have a base image. The base image is typically an operating system like Debian or Ubuntu or Alpine or whatever you choose. And then you add multiple layers on top of the image. You could install some applications like an editor, Emacs. You could install a web server like Apache. And when you start the container from the image, you get another layer on top of it, which is the writable container layer. So every file that you create is written on top of the next image. It's like an onion. I always say Docker images are like ogres. Have you seen Shrek? Yeah. yeah, ogres are like onions. They have layers. I think this is what Shrek says. And exactly that is true for images. Images have layers. This is why you sometimes call it an onion file system. I hope you are aware of that. Please be aware that these uh, layers here, the layers below the writable layer, are immutable. So they are read only. You cannot write something there. If you would delete the file, you would never delete the file in the base image, but you would always set a marker. You would add something to the writable container. So you would add a flag that the file is deleted, but the file is never really gone. Okay? Question. I'm not sure if you know that. Is it possible to build a Docker image without a base image like Debian, Ubuntu, yeah. Alpine? Yes. How? How would you do that? If I would give you that as a homework, what would you do? <laughs> Such in Google, yes. Could you do it with Java? Could you do it with C sharp? No. Could you do it with Go? Yes. Yes. Could you do it with Rust? Yes. Could you do it with C? Yes. Because below the base image, you always have the Linux kernel. So if you manage to build software that only needs the Linux kernel, nothing else, just the Linux kernel, then it's fine. Then you can really build an image that consists only of a single file. And this single file is just sitting on top of the kernel. In practice, you never do that. In practice, you always have an operating system below. Uh, can you tell me what operating systems are very common, used, uh, very commonly used in connection with Docker? Alpine. Alpine, correct, for runtime images. For instance, for images that run on a web server, something like this. Alpine is a great operating system. Debian is also very frequently used, especially when it comes to more powerful containers that do uh, the building of a software, like translating C Sharp into intermediate language. These things are often based on, on, on Debian. OK, very good. So, and we want to build such an image. Okay, you have here some additional information about how, um, how you can find this stuff. Exactly, we can split it, we can, yeah, Docker files. Now let's talk about Docker files. I think the easiest thing to understand Docker files is to see them in action, okay? 
So let me open a folder here. Let's say this is my web server and let's open this web server folder here with Visual Studio Code. Okay, I trust it. I will zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. Let's create a Docker file. Should we already follow along? If you want, you can, but currently it's also okay if you just follow what I'm doing on the screen because the steps will be very, very simple. It's more for understanding the, the core principle, okay? So this demo is not that important. We will not continue it. It's just a demo to prove the concept, to give you enough information to follow the Kubernetes part. So let me create an HTML file, for instance, and let's add a simple HTML file uh, whose title should be hello docker and here we will just say h1 exactly hello docker something like this and now I want to build a web server that serves this static file now you have, your, you have to use your imagination this could be your static web app this could be your react application this could be your angular application this could be your Svelte application your view application your single page your blazer application Single page apps only consist of static files, like my index.html. In my case, it will be super, super trivial, but still, it is a single page app. And now we need a Docker file. Every Docker file starts with a from clause. And here we specify the base image. If you can remember what we had here in the slides, I told you that every image has a base image. And therefore, we have to choose a base image on which we want to base our code. If we would write Docker or Rust or C or C++ code that wouldn't need a base image, we would write from scratch. That means no base image. We are the base image. An operating system like Debian does exactly that. If you take a look at the Docker file of Debian, you will find from scratch in the first line. But typically we don't do that as application developers. Do you have an idea what base image could we use for building an image that serves a single page app to a browser. What could we use? We need a web server, right? So, any idea? Nginx. Nginx. I agree. Let's take Nginx. Where can we get all these images from? There is the so-called Docker Hub. It's at hub.docker.com. And there we can look for images, for instance, Nginx. Nginx is a very popular web server, a very lightweight web server, and it works like a charm. This is how you can pull Nginx, Docker pull Nginx. And you can, if you take a close look here, where is it here? Let me zoom in a little bit. You can use an Nginx version that runs on top of Linux Alpine. And that is a very, very efficient and fast and small web server, taking Alpine Linux and taking Nginx on top of it. And that's the whole idea. When you start the Docker file, you have to think of what is my base image. Sometimes all you need is the base image. If you want to run Postgres or MySQL or MongoDB or SQL Server, you want just to run the database, right? Why bother creating your own image? You can run the image as it is. But if you want to, uh, to host your own application, you have to use a base image like a web server or something like this and put your code on top of it. And this is exactly what we are going to do. So in our case, we will just say, take Nginx Alpine. So let's build something on top of the Nginx web server. Now the Nginx web server, if we scroll down a little bit, even more, even more, even more. Then you will see, if I zoom in a little bit here, has a, a, a clearly defined folder. Here you see this folder where you can put your static application, your static single page app, and Nginx will serve these static files from exactly there. So what we can do, I will copy this folder here to make sure that I don't make a mistake. We can copy the index.html to exactly that folder. And this line, this line here, is exactly what I meant with this next image. So this thing here adds a layer on top of my onion. 
So Nginx is already uh, a, an onion, a layered on layered and layered and layered. In the middle, we have Alpine, then we have Nginx and so on. And now we put our own application as a separate additional layer on top of our image. Understand? It is super crucial to understand that this layering in Docker is hugely important when it comes to performance. Because Docker is smart enough to recognize if multiple of your images are based on the same base image, like Alpine, for instance, that Docker will only store the base image once. You will not fill up your precious solid state disks with unnecessary virtual disks. You only have the base image once. And if you have dozens of applications based on this base image, the base image will only be present once. Also, when pulling down an image from the internet, Docker will recognize that it already has the huge base image on your disk. So it will not download the base image again. It will only download those layers which are really different and which are not already on your machine. Got it? Why do I say this is important? Well, build time, install time. If you deploy your application to your Kubernetes cluster, for instance, the Kubernetes cluster will be faster deploying your application because it already has the base image downloaded. Got it? Understood? This is the reason why you have this, this layering, this onion system. And believe it or not, that's it. We are done. That's the entire Docker file because we have a very simple application here. Question? Uh-huh, yeah, how exactly. Let's try to build this Docker file. So, here we are. Let's build this Docker file, and there is a statement which is called Docker build. Then you can give it a name, dash T is a tag. Let's call it hello Nginx. And then you specify the folder name where the, the Docker file can be found. It's not perfectly correct what I'm saying here, but the mental model is okay. Now, you see, the, the Docker system is now reading all the data that we have here. And it's downloading everything, and in a bunch of moments, here you can see, we are done. So now we have an image which is called Hello Nginx, and it was created in nearly no time, because it is so small. Let's take a look at this image. Docker images, find Hello Nginx, something like this. And as you can see, the entire image is only 22.1 megabyte. That's the entire operating system, that's the entire web server, and our single page app. Understood? We already have an image. We can use that. We can publish that. We can run that on the, uh, on the, on the HTL Leonding cloud or any other cloud. Let's try that. Docker run. Give it the port. For instance, 808080. I will publish it on my local machine, 8080. And hello, Nginx. Good. Started. Let's go to localhost 8080. And here we are. See? If we stop everything, I can prove it to you. It's really coming from there because if I want to reload it, <laughs> I have to stop it, of course. It was not automatically stopped, I'm sorry for that, but now, see, it's gone. So what you should remember is a Docker file is a kind of recipe for building a Docker image. Docker images consist of layers, and those layers, the purpose of these layers is to save storage, to save bandwidth, because we only install layers that we need for multiple applications once. That's the important thing that you should remember here. Question. Um, you exposed the port 80 to your local port 88. Yes. So does the Nginx um, image expose the port 80? Or That's correct. Nginx by default exposes the port 80. Yes. Mm -hmm. The default HTTP port that is exposed by uh, Nginx. Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Any other questions? Okay. 
I'm fine. Let's, let's make that a little bit more complicated. That's the last step that you need for your survival kit for Docker. And then we can immediately switch to our main topic today, that's Kubernetes. But let's do the following. Let's make something which is very, very simple. We'll just add a TypeScript file here. This TypeScript file will be super, super simple. It will just say uh, const greet of type string equals to hello world. Okay. And it will say console log greet. In the index.html file, we will specify a script with a source that says index.js, JavaScript, something like this. And let's move that one to here. So it will run when we start the application. Got it? So essentially what we have to do is we have to translate the TypeScript file into JavaScript. Let's quickly do that. Um, TSC index.ts. I have not installed TSC globally. Let's quickly do that. We will not do that locally later on. So that's just for demo purposes. So as you can see, we translate the TypeScript file into JavaScript. This is the JavaScript file. And if I try to open this HTML thing, just to prove the point, I will get hello world in the console. Got it? So our job is to translate the TypeScript file to host everything in Nginx and then build an image from it. How can we do that? Now let's delete the index.js again, okay? And let's think about what we have to do. We have two possibilities. We can either, now follow closely, this is important for your, for your diploma but, and so on. We can either compile the code locally and then copy the ready-made compiled files into the image. Or we can compile the code inside the Docker file. And that is the interesting one, what we're going to do now. Let me show you what I mean. We go into the Docker file and here we suddenly specify a second from statement. In this from statement, I will use the base image node Alpine, which will give me a very compact and small version of an op a Linux operating system with node installed, with the latest version of node installed. Now I can do the following. I can say, uh, let's give this guy a name, okay? As build. Now I can say, um, let's run npm install minus g, like global, TypeScript. And once TypeScript is installed, we can say tsc index.ts. So we are building the JavaScript code inside the Docker file. And this is a general concept. You could build your C sharp code in the Docker file by running .NET build. You can build your jar files. I'm hoping I'm not telling you wrong things by running Java, the Java compiler and, and, and compiling your Java into something else. You can compile your C code, your Go code, your Rust code, whatever you want to do. You can do whatever you want to do. You can run your unit tests, everything in a Docker file. This is called a multi-stage Docker file because we have one stage, this one, which does the building. And then we have a second stage and get what, guess what we have to do here. We have to add another copy command and here we can say from build. So we are referring to the build up here and then we are going to copy <laughs> index.js to the current folder. Sorry, not to the current folder, to this folder, of course. And to make our uh, Docker file a little bit easier to read, well, we can say uh, work dear, this one, and then we can make it a little bit easier by just specifying dot. I think even if you have not so much experience with Docker files, you can probably guess from the context what the different statements do. Understood? We still have one error in the script. We want to compile index.ts, but we have never copied it. So the last thing that we have to do 
is we have to copy the index.ts file to let's say slash app. It's it's good. It's something like this. Or let's let's do it like below work dear app and then we can say dot and now it should work. Do you understand the principle? Now we are using a Docker container to build our application. TypeScript to JavaScript, C Sharp to Intermediate Language, C to Executable, Rust to Executable, Go to Executable. This is what we do here. And then we are building the resulting image which does no longer have the source code, no TypeScript anymore, just the object code, in our case JavaScript and the HTML file. So this will be tiny, tiny, tiny. This one will be rather huge because we have Node, we have TypeScript, but at runtime we don't need that. Understood? This works exactly the same in C Sharp and exactly the same in nearly all programming languages. Multi-stage Docker files. Let's quickly try that. Uh, where is my Docker build statement? Here is my Docker build statement. Let's make it a little bit larger and let it run. So, I will let it run through and then we'll analyze the output. And I have a mistake. You see index.js not found. Let me see. Yes, of course. I forgot slash app. See? There was a mistake up here. So let's try it again. Oh, I'm on, on Windows currently. We'll switch to Linux later on. Good. Let's build it again. Nice. If you take a look, a close look at what Docker has written here, we will see, let me, screw, here it is, okay. You see, it started with the whole Node Alpine stuff. Then it was at one point in time here, running the npm install and the TypeScript compiler. And at the end, it was copying, you see that one, copying the index.js from the build container into the final image. And now we have an image that should be a little bit more powerful. Let's give it a try. I'm going to run it again and do the port mapping, this one. Good. Let's go into my browser and let's go back to our localhost 8080. And if I run it, you see it says hello world. So it correctly had my index.js created from TypeScript. Okay, I don't have a favorite icon, but that's not a problem. I can prove it to you if I click here. If I click here, index.js, uh-huh, it doesn't find it. Yeah, here it is. I have my index.js, so it is really exactly as I promised you to be. And this is what you have to understand. Docker files are recipes for building images. And Docker files are not just copying the results. Docker files are much more. They are, to a certain degree, a replacement to build servers. You can ignore things like, I don't know, uh, GitHub Actions, or uh, Azure DevOps, or Jenkins. You can do the same things in Docker files. Docker files are absolutely not complicated. They have from clauses, work to your clauses, copy clauses, run clauses, and maybe two or three other things more. It's really simple. The complexity in Docker files are those scripts. You have to learn how to automate your build process. You don't have Visual Studio in a Docker file doing all the magic for you. You have to understand the command line interface, the CLI. And you have to master it. Give me just one second and then I'll go to your questions, okay? If you take a look at Nginx, for instance, if we take a look at the Docker file for Nginx, it's equally simple, you see, from some environment variables, and then you have a single run statement. But do you see where the complexity is? This is a single statement in the Docker file. All that you see here is a single statement in the Docker file up until here. That's a lot of bash scripting going on. And that's the complexity. Docker files, writing Docker files, it's absolutely not complicated. You have seen 80% of what you have to know to build Docker file. The complexity is mastering bash, mastering build systems on the command line, 
you have to know and master the command line in order to be a good Docker developer. Got it? And at the end, we have a Docker image and we can run it. Currently, I'm running it locally. Later on, we are going to run it in Kubernetes. So we have questions. Shoot. I think we had a question here, didn't we? No. Good. This is essentially what we need to learn. There is so much more to learn about Docker. Docker is so, so powerful, but that's it. Just for me as a feedback, who just learned something new? Who wasn't aware of some of the aspects that I just showed you here? I want to check what you already know. Most of you. Okay, good, 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 good. So now you know, this is level zero. If you want to go into our school's Kubernetes cluster or use a cluster, a Kubernetes system in Azure or Google Cloud or even in Docker Desktop, this is something you have to understand and you have to practice. If you don't master Docker, you will have a very hard time in Kubernetes. Okay, so this, in your mind, this, this is a level zero, the absolute, le uh, the, the lowest level that we have. And now we are going to move and take a look in Kubernetes, what Kubernetes is and what we can do with Kubernetes. Good? Yeah? Yeah. Maybe we will do one additional exercise. It just came to my mind that I should really do that. Uh, you don't have to follow along. I will delete the code in a second. Uh, just to show you that C Sharp works exactly the same. This is a C Sharp course, so it is important. So if we take, for instance, an ASP.NET Core Web API, um, put that somewhere, I don't need that code later on. And let's, yeah, let's take five, and you see I enable Docker here. See that one? Enable Docker. If I create this project, and I take a look at the generated Docker file, it really works exactly like we just learned it. If you take a closer look here, you will see that there is also a base image. This is not that important. I think you can currently ignore that one. That's not that important. I wanted to show you that one. You have a build image, which uses a base image, which is, which is called SDK. This is the base image where all the C Sharp compiler and the .NET Core framework is installed and so on and so on. And then we are building additional images on top of that. We do a build, we do a publish, something like this. And now comes the important one, the final one. The one that will be stored is no longer based on the SDK. It's based on the base image, which we can find up here. And the base image is based upon ASP.NET. So this is the runtime image, the runtime base image. And this one is the compile time base image, okay? The compile time base image is huge, but we don't care because we only need it to compile the software. The runtime base image needs to be tiny because this is the image that we sent to Kubernetes and we don't want to wait for installing and starting up our application. Understood? Yes, I agree. This Docker file is a little bit more complicated. You see they have multiple layers. They have the base layer and then they have the, no, here, the build layer and then they have the publish layer. Microsoft is doing that to optimize caching of your images. They want to speed up your build process. But conceptually, that's not so important. It's just an optimization step. You could easily make this Docker file simpler, just as we did it with our TypeScript example. But yes, they, they went the extra mile to make it a little bit more efficient. But the concepts are exactly the same. Understood? Got it? Good. And for any other programming language, it would look like exactly the same. Great. Next step. We were at level zero, what you have to master in order to get going. Now we reach level two, uh, level one. Okay, the, the first level that, that's getting a little bit more interesting. We need to somehow publish 
the images that we create. Because if we have the image on our local computer, nobody can use it. The Kubernetes cluster can't know about it. Okay, granted, if you have a Kubernetes cluster running locally on your machine, it would be able to fetch the images from there. But in real life, for instance, the Kubernetes cluster in our school is not running on your local computer. It's running somewhere down in the basement. So therefore, we have to send the image to the Kubernetes cluster. In real life, you have to send your results to your customers. They want to run the software in their cloud, in their data center. Understand what I mean? And for that, we are going to use a so-called image registry. And one image registry, you have already seen it, it's the Docker Hub. The Docker Hub, this one, is a registry. And inside of this registry, we have so-called repositories. Nginx would be a repository. Or do you want to use open JDK? I don't know if you would want that, but yeah, no, just kidding. Uh, you, you can use that one, open JDK. Or do you want to use MongoDB? Voila, here is Mongo. Do you want to use Postgres? Voila, here is Postgres. So remember the, the terms, registry, is the server and the database where everything is stored. For instance, the Docker Hub. Repository is the product or project. Inside of the repository, you have the different images. And those images have tags. See that one? And these tags, they describe the variant of the rep repository. So you can, in this case, when we talk about Postgres, you have an image per version. You see, version 13, version 12, version 11, and so on. And additionally, for every version, you have different base images. For instance, there is an, a base image based on Debian, a base image might be from Ubuntu, a base image might be from Alpine. So you have version X on Debian, version X on Alpine, version X on Ubuntu. And these are the images that you have. Got it? So we have registry, repositories, images. And what we, we now have to do is we have to somehow publish our image into such a registry. How do we do that? Well, first thing, we need to have a user account in our target registry. In the Docker Hub, you can easily create a user. I'm already signed in here, as you can see, but you can go on hub.docker.com and get your own account. You can just register there. Same is true for our school's um, Kubernetes cluster. In our school, we have our own Docker registry. So you do not need to copy the images out into the public internet but you can use registry.cloud.htlleonding.act. We have a dedicated registry for that. So you have to register on cloud.htlleonding.act and then you automatically also get a user for the registry. You can also create your own registries out in the public internet. For instance, Microsoft Azure, the cloud infrastructure from Microsoft, they have their own so-called Azure Container Registry. So with your credits that you get as a student, you can create your own container registry and put your images there. It depends. It's just like a build server. Do you prefer Jenkins? Do you prefer, uh, I don't know, Bitbucket, GitHub, or maybe Microsoft, uh, Microsoft uh, Azure Pipelines? It depends. They all do approximately the same, but they have some strength some weaknesses, it depends. You have to choose, okay? In our case, for this demo, last demo before the break, we will take our image and put it on the Docker Hub. How do I do that? Well, the first thing that I would have to do, but I don't, I will not do it because I already did it for you, is Docker login. You just say Docker login, and at the end, you specify the registry where you want to log in. So if you check the website of the 
of our school's cloud, you will see the name of the cloud. So you have to specify Docker login name of the registry, and then you have to enter user and password. If you enter nothing like that, you log into the Docker Hub. The Docker Hub is like GitHub, but not for source code, but for images. I already did that, so I'm already logged in. Now, we created an image together, and this image was called Hello and Jax, right? This was our image. And now we want to publish this image. How do we do that? How would you publish code on GitHub with Git? Correctly. What do you think is the statement? How we can publish an image on Docker Hub? Docker push, exactly. Let's try that. Docker push hello and Genix. It will fail. See? Doesn't work. You have to have very special credentials if you want to publish something, a name like that. That is only allowed for so-called trusted publishers. So if you have a very, very well-known product like Node or Mongo or Postgres, then you get such a beautiful name. If you are a usual guy like I am, you have to use a prefix, and the prefix has to be the name of the registry, Docker Hub, we can ignore it, and your name, your user account. So what we have to do is we have to tag our hello and Genix with my user account in the Docker Hub and then call it hello and Genix. What? Ah, sorry, docker tag. I forgot to write tag here. And I should put the dash T here. Good. Now if I run the docker images again, you will see that I now have two images, hello nginx and rstropx slash hello nginx. They have the same ID, you see it here, so technically they are the same image. But they have two names. And the purpose of the second name is that I can publish it now. I can go to Docker push, and here I just say rstropx slash. Nice. Do you see what we, what we learn here? Mounted from, mounted from, and so on. That means all the elements of mounted from are onion layers which are already on the Docker Hub and they don't need to be uploaded. So the system only uploads the delta, only those things that are not already in the internet. And now we are done. If we take a look here on my personal repositories, here we are. Let's refresh that guy. Here you are. Now the world can see our beautiful single page app. Everybody who likes can now see Docker pull and run the application that I created. And this is the way how we publish images so that our Kubernetes cluster, which is in our basement, in the school of our basement, or maybe in your Google Cloud or your Azure Cloud, how they can get your software. So what you have to essentially to do is you write your code, you write the Docker file, that builds the app and creates the image. And then you say Docker push to the registry of your choice. It might be Docker Hub. It might be our school's registry. It might be a registry in your own cloud. And your Kubernetes cluster will pull the images from there and run them. So the second thing that you have to master in order to work with Kubernetes is handling of registries. There would be a lot more to say about registries. But this is a starter course, and I promised you a kind of survival kit for how to publish code to be run in Kubernetes. And this is exactly what we wanted to do. Questions. All the steps that I just showed you are described step by step by step in the slide deck that you will get from me, OK? But it's really not complicated, because all you have to remember is Docker push. Nothing else. Question. Could you also set the repository to private and give only 
uh, a few of maps. Yes, yes, yes. If you want to do that with the Docker Hub, you have to pay for it. Okay. If you do that, for instance, in the Azure Cloud, every Docker repository, every image repository is private by default and it's protected by Azure Active Directory. So if you think of a company context, your employees, the, the user accounts of your employees are identical to the user accounts used for the registry. Okay. So the developers use their developer accounts to sign in. Of course, you need special credentials for the Kubernetes cluster so that the Kubernetes cluster can fetch images from the private registry. Mm -hmm. For our school, the registry is available over the public internet, so you can push from at home, but it's always private. So you have to use credentials. You cannot uh, push in a, in a public way. Okay. Yep. But for the Docker Hub, if you want to use it for free, you have to make your image public. Uh, public yeah. Otherwise, they, you have to pay. There's a little bit of a difference with GitHub. It's like GitHub was in the past. Yeah. It's, it's really hard for Docker as a company to earn money because their free tools are so good that most people are not likely to pay. Yeah. Further questions? Did you learn something new with these registries and repositories and images? Has it become clearer? Good? Nice. So now we will do a break. Uh, we will do a break, let's say until, uh, when is the break? I think it is now, right? Or In three minutes. In three minutes. So we have 15 minutes break and we will continue at 10 and then we will start with a completely new topic because now we want to switch towards Kubernetes and there we will spend a little bit more time and really explore in detail what this Kubernetes stuff is and how it works and what different concepts are. I'm looking forward to that. We will start at 10.